Hi everyone, welcome to So What with Sulky. I'm Ellen March, and I hope that you are all finished with all of your holiday stuff and ready to just enjoy the days coming up. Today, I have a special guest joining us because I thought we should really be thinking about how to service our machines, how to get them in tip-top shape, ready for all the makes that we want to do in 2021, and what better way to start thinking about that than to have Eric Drexler himself come on to So What today and tell us all about machine maintenance. Eric has been a sewing machine technician for quite some time, and he has seen it all. People bring him machines to fix that have not been cleaned in maybe their entire lifetime. He's got some horror stories for us. Also, he's got just some good tips and good things that we can think about doing to maintain our machines in between sort of service appointments. So I thought it would be great to have him come on, give us his expertise. We're going to learn a lot from him this afternoon. And before I bring him on, I want to remind you all about our New Year's Eve bash, okay? There's only about a week and a half or so until we go live with our New Year's Eve party. So if you have not registered, don't hesitate. Register today. There are still spots available. There are still kits available. Um, if you don't get your kit in time, that's totally fine because you can watch and re-watch and participate in this event even after the live event finishes. We will always accept your questions and get right back to you um, if you have any concerns as you're going through your project. So don't hesitate, register today. You will want to join us for this once in a lifetime opportunity of this great New Year's Eve party. So just to recap, we will be with Sally Tomato. They have created an exclusive bag pattern for this event. It is the Zelda bag and you will see it here first. So Jessica from Sally Tomato will be taking us through the bag construction. I will be taking you all through hand embroidery as well as machine embroidery to embellish your bag. So there's an option for everybody at every skill level and I hope you come on uh, board and that you're excited to sew with us New Year's Eve. All right, so enough of that business. I'm gonna go ahead and bring Eric on. If you are not familiar with Eric, then you're not familiar with Sulky, okay? Let's just say that. Eric is a national Sulky educator, and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about himself as well. Welcome, Eric. Oh, I can't hear you. Hold on, I've muted you. I knew I would do that, I'm so sorry. Take it away, Eric. Can you hear me now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was, hi, Ellen. How you doing? Great. No, I'm so we glad that you're here on myself. So What? What? <laughs> I said, we're not going to talk about me. We're talking about sewing machines, remember? And thread and stabilizers. <laughs> well, of course. But everybody who doesn't already know you, because this is your first time on So What?, um, just tell them a little bit about what you do for Sulky and beyond in the sewing machine realm. Well, for Sulky, national educator kind of puts me all over the country, go out to guilds and uh, do lectures and classes. That's probably my most fun thing that I do because it's a little smaller and intimate. Um, consumer shows, we teach there and exhibit, of course, and have our have our big store we set up so people can shop while they're at the at the consumer shows those are coming back i know they are we're already <laughs> scheduling them for next year so got my fingers crossed and my delta tickets from last year still valid um and we do some trade shows too where we actually sell to dealers so that you will find your product in local de at local stores too. sell displays to them um but what a lot of people don't know about the other side of my life is I've been a sewing machine mechanic since 1984. So that's a little over 34 years, 35 years. Um, and I've seen everything from the first computerized machine come out to, you know, the old, old treadle machines. So I work on just about everything 
Yes, there's some been some nightmare stories, but we'd have to narrow that down because I'm sure we don't have all day to talk about all those. <laughs> uh, but I'm always shocked and surprised. Uh, my wife is always shocked and surprised when she hears a sewing emergency. But I think it, we're going to touch on about 100 people at least with that comment that, oh, my goodness, my sewing machine just died and and it's Friday night and they're closed on the weekends. And, you know, it is an urgent thing when you have a project that's in the pipeline and ready to go. Mm -hmm. So uh, I try to accommodate those people that have sewing emergencies so that, you know, I, they can get back to their projects as quickly as possible. Yeah, you are like the MacGyver of sewing machines. So um, in lieu of repairing our machines with, you know, duct tape and uh, paper clips, we should take them to you, someone who knows them. And you work on all different sewing machine brands, so I'm sure that you see it all. But maybe you could kind of drive home this concept of servicing our machines regularly. And what does that look like? How regularly? And even if our machine is performing well, it needs to be serviced, right? Yeah, that's very correct. Um, as far as you being able to service it, it's like we used to be able to service our own cars. Now I opened up the hood of my car and look for the big on off switch because, you know, I had oil and windshield wiper fluid nowadays where I used to work on my own car. The new machines are typically a metal housing with a clam shell that, you know, goes together and you have to get that shell off of it to get into any of the internal parts. So it's a lot more difficult for customers to work on their own machines. Uh, you might be able to take the, the end off just above the needle and maybe a bottom cover plate off, but you know some of them you can actually break the housing getting the, getting the covers off of it. So it's not a great idea to, to dive in yourself. But there's certain areas that you can look for and that you can maintain. Uh, they get a lot of heavy lint buildup and you know need some regular oiling in in some of those places too that dry out sometimes because there's lint in there soaking up the oil. And you just took the lint out with the oil included. So, you know, even if you're, you know, maintaining it yourself, you do need to take it into a mechanic every once in a while so that those covers come off. Never blow into the machine because that just makes the lint and everything migrate over into your computer boards and your motors. And, you know, the fan, the motor has a fan on it that's sucking air into it. So we don't want to pull all that lint and stuff into the motor either. So it really just professionally, you know, need to have it done every couple of years. Uh, if it hasn't been done in, in five years, you need to get it in there soon. Um, there are some regular things that I check on machines that are running properly. Uh, some of which we'll, you know, touch on in the pictures that I sent you, but some of them that I couldn't really get a good picture of, like a burr that is on the hook. And everybody asked me what a burr is. A burr is from you pulling the fabric back into the or the needle back into the path of the hook and the hook is the part that comes around and grabs the needle and they're literally nowadays brushing the needle as it goes by it so if you're tugging your fabric through you're going to bring the needle into the path of the hook eventually and you do that you know once twice thrice and it's going to put a little chiseled edge on there a little mark on there now when the thread grabs a hole it grabs a hold of the thread it doesn't want to let go and slide off that smooth point. It has a it has a little nick in there, and you have to you know file that little nick off. And we've got specialized you know little armature sticks that have diamond grit in them and more fine than any sandpaper that you find. So it's not going to eat up the metal, but it's going to polish it back up to its you know pristine shape again. That's something I do on every single toy machine is check for a burr on the hook, because a lot of people pull their fabric through. It can also be done by the improper needle size. If you're sewing everything with a size 80 needle, because that's what you quilt with, it won't go through your jeans because the jeans are more dense, more thick, and you hit that very dense thickness and your needle is not gonna go straight through it. It's gonna angle off to the side and shoot backwards or forwards and cause damage down below. So, you know, having the proper needle size is very important too, or the needle type to uh, you know, prevent damage from the machine. But mm -hmm. a lot of people pull their fabrics through and that's totally a customer caused damage to the machine. Yeah, I think that's a really important point is there are a lot of times where people are wondering, 
why do I have skip stitches? Why why is uh, why do I have bird's nest under the fabric? Or why is my thread keep breaking? You say this is a high quality thread, and a lot of these things can be prevented just by servicing our machines regularly or being mindful of those things you just talked about. You know, there could be a burr somewhere or something isn't aligning properly anymore after time. So, um, you know, uh, and for somebody like me who uh, I am literally sewing every single day. So it is hard for me to think about having three to five days or however long I would have to wait to get my machine back from being serviced. But it is essential and it is important. And I think, too, people would be surprised to know that it's affordable. I mean, it's definitely more affordable than just buying a new sewing machine. So, yeah, and and you touched on a lot of things. Affordable is, you know, if you maintain it, doesn't cost you so much money in the in the long run and later on when you have a lot of damaged parts. Um, if you have a if you have a machine that needs service, meaning some of your pictures will show that that um, damage to the machine can actually cause thread breakage because it's dragging across rugged parts. So, you know, having it regularly serviced is also like a, a, an inspection of the machine to make sure you all everything is well in your world. Um, one thing you ma mentioned that is always brings a smile to my face and a comment is they always say, oh, it's bird nesting underneath. After they just got the machine serviced, I have a nice little clean sample underneath there with perfect tensions. I know it's working. And they call me up and say, oh, it's bird nesting underneath. My, my thing that comes to my mind first is it's between the chair and the sewing machine. It is not the sewing machine. It's the, and a customer came back and says, it's the loose nut between the chair and the sewing machine. <laughs> no, it is generally a customer. <laughs> it's generally a customer problem. It's not the sewing machine. It's not the thread. It's not, you need to just pull everything out, start from scratch, rethread the machine from the beginning pull the bobbin out, rethread it, then tell me you still have an issue. A lot of times they've done something wrong, like not threading the take-up lever or missed the tension or had the presser foot down when they were threading the tension. If you just pull everything out, take a deep breath, drink a glass of wine, come back, you'd be <laughs> a lot clearer thinking and, you know, calmer thinking and, you know, rational. When you get all flustered, then, you know, everything just seems to get worse and you're turning dials and levers and messing it up worse. Mm -hmm. So... And, yeah, and yeah. one more comment about you needing your sewing machine every single day. I have pity for people that that want that have to give up their baby for a day or two days or three. I, I do like three days, four days turnover time, which I've heard is the fastest in the country. Most um, dealerships are a week, 10 days, two weeks to get your machine back, sometimes longer. Um, get a, another sewing machine. If you straight stitch sew, get yourself a really good quality straight stitch sewing machine so you're not disabled when you send your big embroidery machine down. Yes, you can't embroider, but it doesn't stop you from sewing. So get a spare mm -hmm. machine. You know, you have pity, but that's all you're going to get. It still falls behind <laughs> all the other machine people that have the same issues. You know, there's five other people in front of you when they came in. I can't have pity on everybody. I have to do them, you know, in date order. Yeah. Well, I have plenty of machines, so. Uh, <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> I have a problem, and but it's a happy problem. Um, all right, so speaking of the pictures, let's get to some of these. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the first one. So we talked about cleaning the machine. Oops, wrong picture. Ooh, cleaning the machine and not blowing um, air into it or that type of thing. And here's why, right? Yeah, and they make little vacuums with a little brush on the end of it. It's sucking it out is fine. You just don't want to blow that chunky stuff into the machine because it's all encased in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you see on there, and you'll probably get another picture later, is I'm lifting those uh, felt pads out from in between the feed dogs. Um, the customer's problem or her complaint was it didn't feed the material. Well, she's got layers and layers and layers of lint built up in, you know, in there, she's maybe maintained it, but never taken the plate off. Um, and her feed dogs could not come up through the plate because she had this thick pad underneath there that was preventing it from coming up high enough. So just lifting those two pieces up, it fixed the problem. 
Like but you can see it looks like the Grand Canyon of light. Here it is. Yeah. Layers upon layers. <laughs> Different colored projects have been run through there and just packed on top of itself. So. Yeah, and it's Pretty, good to uh, know you, you can't see these things from your vantage point as the sower, you know, without no. lifting that stuff the front up. Cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's with the front cover off. You can see about 50% of that with the needle plate taken off, though. Anybody can take the plate off and, and look down inside there and you know, brush some of that stuff out. But the stuff in the front where the wires are, you cannot see because that's with the covers taken off. You, you would never be able to get that stuff out of there. So here's some more lint I see around the bobbin case. Yeah, it just packed in and around there. Uh, mm -hmm. You had mentioned also, and we'll get to needles later, but needles have play a large part of, of fuzz too. If you're using just your standard 80 size needle, you know, with your cotton threads, um, we always recommend a top stitch needle because it has a larger eye and they're very smooth. They're good for metallic threads um, and you get a lot less fuzz and thread, you know, this fuzzy stuff coming off of it because it's not raking through the eye of the needle. And, you know, before it even gets to the to the eye of the needle, it's already digging little fibers off of it. So using the proper type of needle can prevent a lot of, you know, lint buildup also. <clears throat> yeah, that, if you just take the needle plate off, you can see it, but you can't even see her, her thread cutter. There's a thread cutter underneath there that sweeps across and cuts the thread. And you can't even see that part in there either. Yeah, so if you're noticing that that thread cutter isn't working, then you probably have some thread buildup under there, yeah? And thread cutters um, are notorious for leaving about, uh, I don't know, half an inch of thread where they've come over, they've grabbed it and pulled it through. They, it's just dragging it across a razor. And there, I've opened up machines and seen 30, 40, 50 little teeny tiny pieces of thread that have also migrated around and moved around too. So those little pieces, one, two, or three of them can get stuck in your thread cutter and the thread cutter won't operate back and forth either, or it gets clogged up and won't cut it. Yeah, that picture that you have now is cover off the machine. Uh, this machine is an easy enough machine to take five screws off the bottom and the bottom just comes off. This is a Janome, so... It is very serviceable for them, and they could take this cover off and use a air compressor to actually blow that stuff out of there, and it wouldn't uh, go into the machine any further. Mm. Fuzzy, fuzzy. What are we looking at here? This is the take-up lever is that thing that jumps up and down in front of the machine. So this is up above your needle in the light area and where your uh, where your needle's coming from. It gets a lot of lint in there, too, because it's going through thread guides and through your tension and up over your take-up lever. Anytime that the thread takes a bend around something, it's going to flick off a little bit of fuzz. But it's it's hard sometimes to get the side cover open. A lot of times it's just one screw, and you can pop, you know, open up the side cover and see all this stuff. And again, a little lint brush or something like that to kind of pull that stuff out of there would, would be well served. But near impossible unless you know what you're doing to oil this you really have to know where the linkages are to get in there and have it in just the right position to oil it. So it's not, it's not your grandma's sewing machine. We got a lot of uh, technology built into this uh, automatic button holders and needle threaders and all that stuff's all packed in up there too. Mm -hmm. So important to go to a professional again. Yeah. Every now and again. Yes. Even if you're maintaining your own, Oh my goodness. Look Here's somebody this. that was not only, <laughs> holding the fabric back or pulling the fabric through, they were holding the fabric back. Yeah, this. I'm gonna see if I can get a little closer. Thing. Yeah, this one is unbelievable. How many needle strikes it takes to to remove metal? Number one, but you can see all the needle strikes that are still there and all around the outside. This is this is a a very extreme case. You know, I, I, I don't normally see stuff like this, but you asked me to grab some extreme ones, and this is definitely it. Yeah, so in this case, you've got to order this whole part, correct? You really should. I mean, I mean if it's yeah. not available anymore, I take a little bit of sandpaper and I and I buff that out, but you're supposed to have a hole that looks like this. Oops, let me give it over a little bit. This, like this. So if you wallow that hole out, you've got one that's egg-shaped, and it's not going to, you know stitch correctly it's supposed to be skinny and small and, and not let your fabric flow through there so it's definitely a good idea to, to replace that and not just you know buff this buff the burrs off of it mm -hmm. 
These I found really interesting because it never occurred to me that the bottom of the presser foot could cause problems. Yeah, this is a, a majority of sewing machines because a lot of people put their fabric right up to the edge of the feed dogs and start sewing. I'm getting a battery low signal, so let me know if I, you don't hear me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Switch headsets or something. Um, but because the, the back of the foot is going to be a lot more chewed up because the front of the foot um, has fabric underneath there, but the back doesn't yet until the fabric gets there. But a lot of machines are feed dog, uh, metal feed dogs, and they are actually raking against the bottom of that chrome foot. And we'll remove the chrome, and that acts like a gathering foot. It will get so bad that you'll see almost like a, a copper color through there after the chrome's removed. And that will act like a gathering foot and start slowing down your material, causing drag to the top layer of material. When your bottom layer is still pulling, your top layer is going to be dragging. So it's going to be, you know, an uneven fe feeding system. But I definitely recommend flipping that foot over and taking a look at the bottom of that because a lot of machines need they need to be replaced on for sure. That is so fascinating. It I, never occurred to me to look at the bottom of the foot. So that's a good, good tip. Yeah. All right, so here we have, you know, thread can get caught in the darndest places. So this, I'm assuming you could not see this without opening the machine. So no one knew that that little thread nest was there. Oh, we're losing Eric. So I'm going to come back on for a moment <laughs> while he adjusts. But um, <laughs> you can tell that he had to open the machine here in order to see that. And I'm sure it was slowing down the bobbin winder and causing all kinds of problems. Um, you know, are you back with us? I am. I had to switch headsets. It kept saying low, low, low. And then it just died. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have backups, right? Excellent. So yes, I, I know you started off before it died saying you can't see this from the from the outside of the machine. This is with the whole front cover taken off. And yeah, I start there's a lot of things you find once the front covers come off. But yeah, this one, I'm not sure how it happens. Sometimes it's the tail to start with. Sometimes it's the tail you left because you're winding multiple bobbins and left one on there. Um, I've had it. People tell me they've um, gotten thread wrapped around their hand wheel because they had left their second spool up there when they were sewing with the other one and didn't, you know, maintain their tail. And the tail got caught up. So there's pictures in there of that one, too. Whoa, that that sound effect happened right at the right spot. Um. <laughs> I know. I thought I had muted my. Uh, I, that was my business. That was my sewing machine repair business. I thought I had muted that earlier, uh, but uh, apparently I got sidetracked. It was definitely ominous, though. It <laughs> was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so here's yeah, another the, case. There's the one about yeah. the hand wheel. Yeah. Same thing. I mean, it's real close to where that bobbin winder is. It's it's inches away from there, but you get thread in between the housing of the sewing machine and the hand wheel, and it'll just grab it and unwind the whole spool of thread and push your push your hand wheel off you know that's crazy here's another one where the thread has just yeah. really gotten a hold of it obviously not the same machine green on one blue on another one i didn't <laughs> make that stuff up <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah so here's another this, little area where this... the thread got caught yeah, and, and we all see that down by the needle where it's kind of shredded the thread back to one little fiber and the rest of them are all, all wound around it. But this is actually coming from a spot in the tension unit in, a, I think it was either a baby lock or a brother. Um, but it got caught up in the tension unit and yeah, I could not see this from the outside of the machine at all. I had to get in there with a the little dental pick and start pulling at it and it's, this thing came out at me. It was only a little teeny tiny tail. I almost didn't see it when I was looking at it, but... They can hide in some pretty obscure places, but if this thing is inside your tension that's wound up five, six, seven strands of thread, that's holding your tension open. So if you say it's bird nesting and it will not quit bird nesting, that culprit could be in between your tension discs somewhere holding them open, not allowing you to have any tension on your thread. That's not common, but I see it, you know, twice a month. 
Yeah, I imagine that, you know, especially with the holidays coming up and people get new machines or maybe they inherit one, you know, a lot of machines that you might find at a thrift store, it's a really good idea to get it serviced before you ever even touch it in case things like Absolutely. this are the reason that somebody passed it on, right? I, exactly. Absolutely right. A lot of times they, they are threading it wrong from day one and it's a perfectly good sewing machine. They just were threading it wrong. <clears throat> the picture you see here is a uh, thread wrapped around the take-up lever, that thing that jumps up and down in front of the machine. It has linkages that... Oh, I lost Eric. Eric has frozen, so when he comes back, um, we will learn about this, but that is a lot of thread to be uh, yeah. trapped up in there. Oh, Eric, you're back. Yeah, so... Yeah, it, it froze for a second. I wasn't sure if you could hear me or not, but if you get thread wrapped in that take-up lever, it just keeps winding and winding and winding like a little fishing rod. And the computerized machines, when that's happening, will not tell you that the thread's broken because it's still tugging and pulling and, and triggering the sensor. So even though your thread broke, it didn't broke break uh, before the sensor, it broke after the sensor. So it'll just keep winding thread in there and creating a problem when it should have told you the thread broke. That's crazy. That's a lot of thread to be yeah. right there. There's another one in the same yeah. spot, right? Yep. Yeah. I think that's the same one. I was just pulling more thread off of there. It's mm. kind of the bottom of the yo-yo. Keeps going and going and going. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh tell us about this. <laughs> Well, and if one of those little fan blades breaks off, which you breathe on it wrong and they do, um, then you have to replace the fan blade too. And if your fan, and if one blade b comes off, it's like taking a blade off your fan. It just wobbles and makes all sorts of noise. But yeah, this had gotten actually onto the motor belt and carried it down to the motor, and then it just fed straight onto the motor. <laughs> it's just not so common. This was kind of one of the crazier ones, but I've seen it. I've seen it more than a few times. That's crazy. Yeah. All right. So we talked about was, the importance yeah. of changing your sewing machine needles. And I'm so glad you have this image. So uh, I have no idea where you even got that from Facebook or something. I apologize for ripping it off from somebody else. But I, I it was really, really showing what you don't see. You can kind of drag your fingernail down the tip of the needle or, or feel it on the fingerprint on your on your finger, on your thumb. And you can kind of roll that uh, needle down the edge of those your fingerprint and feel whether there's a burr on there. But if you look at it under a microscope, that little burr that you're feeling looks like that. It's a flat spot or a, or a bent over spot. Needles are like knives. They don't stay sharp forever. They do dull even just if you never touch metal with it, just hit fabric. They're going to dull down. And then you have a dull knife going to try to cut something. So you're trying to slice through your fabrics. Needles are very, very important to change often. Like every six sewing hours, that means the needle penetrating the fabric. Uh, I make it a rule just to change it every time I do a project. Because, you know, four or five, six hours into something, I need to change it anyway. So, yes, yeah, very important that you keep new needles in there and change them often. Yeah, and we were also talking about, you know, it's a great idea to grab up needle assortment packs. We have some great organ needle assortment packs for different types of fabrics or, you know, different types of applications. So, <coughs> excuse me, a machine embroidery assortment, a universal assortment, a jersey assortment. That way you have a variety of needle sizes and types at the ready, right? So right. the there's nothing worse <laughs> than being on your last needle in the middle of a project and it breaks on you or something happens. But I change needles so often. I'm very lucky to have organ needles at my disposal in that regard um, because that's pretty much the first thing I go to. If I'm having issues with my machine, I go to the needle first and I always swap it out. Then I see if I'm still having problems. I was just going to say that that's like the number one thing to do. If you're having a problem, change the first thing that's touching the fabric and your thread, change the needle first, rethread the machine. Like I was saying before, but 
Um, that's one of the first lines of attack I tell everybody too. And when, when I start a new class, everybody in class gets a brand new needle because I know they're not going to have any issues. That's not going to be one of the issues if they have if they do have one. We've eliminated that altogether. So I totally agree with that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes another- one needle or needle type doesn't work like another needle type, like a top stitch. I love top stitch needles. Uh, they work on metallic threads. They work on all of our blendables, 12 weight and 30 weight. Uh, it's got a big eye to it and a very sharp point. It's kind of like a universal with a big eye. So less lint uh, friction from the thread hitting the inside edges of that eye. So I love those. And, and you didn't even mention those and all the needles you mentioned. So there's a whole education on needles and what those needles are good for. Everything from super stretchy lycra type fabrics to um, heavy denim fabrics that need a very sharp point. But I'm talking about the eye of the needle in a 80 or a 90 top stitch. Those sometimes have cured things when a universal needle wouldn't work. The bigger eye let the thread glide through there or the metallic thread glide through there. So they have a specific needle for doing everything. I don't say go out and buy everything, but at least get your education on it. Know what you're, what you're what's out there, you know. Mm-hmm. And a few assortment packs for things that you know you're always doing or always sewing. Right. Um, another right. thing I wanted to mention, which I think is important for any of you lucky, lucky people out there about to get a new sewing machine for maybe for Christmas, um, which would be so exciting to find under the tree. Um, and I just am mentioning it because I've heard it happen to people who have told me. So my experience here. Um, but there have been people who get a new machine and they think, oh, I know how to thread this, or, oh, I've used this brand before, or I have been sewing for 50 years, I know how to thread this thing, and they don't bother looking at the manual. And there could be some little idiosyncrasy with the way that that machine was manufactured or something in the bobbin case that's new and improved or something like this that you miss. And then you don't have a successful sewing experience. But we never really think, oh, did I thread that wrong? You know, because we're experienced sewer, this or that. You know, it's happened to me before testing out different machines, different brands that I'm unfamiliar with. So definitely keep that manual close at hand and refer to it until you get it down. You know, you're you're automatically threading something the way you've always kind of known how to. Um, so I don't know if you've had experience with that, but I've had more than a few people tell me that that was the case with um, some of the problems that they were having. Um, I just got my car manual back out. I've owned my new car for two years now because there was something that was went weird on it. And I started reading it cover to cover. Like, I know that, I know that. And oh my God, I didn't know that. And I've owned it for two years. So yes, switching stories. But uh, I've also had a lot of customers tell me oh, you know, you were threading this and you shouldn't have been, or there's a thread guide just before the needle. She's like, I didn't even know there was one there. Nobody showed her. She was going by book only that's two-dimensional. Nobody corrected her ever that had seen it before. So that's the way she's always been told. Nobody corrected her about it. So a lot of times, just sending your machine in for service, they're going to send it back to you threaded. Look at how they have it threaded. They might have something threaded you didn't. Or you were threading around your pretension on the top for before your bobbin winder all the time when you're threading the machine. Well, that adds tension onto it. I have heard so many times that they didn't know that that's how the proper threading was supposed to be on their machine. So you hit that right on the head. Um, I always tell the customer when they're sending the machine into me to get fixed, leave the machine threaded. Number one, I want to see that you're threading it properly. If you are, I will move on to the next thing that may be causing your problem. But if you're not, or you miss that take-up lever, that thing that jumps up and down, I know what your issue is. I know why it ate that $32 bobbin case up, because you didn't thread your take-up lever. And it will eat your bobbin case five stitches into it. So, yeah. Interesting. Leave and, it threaded when you bring your machine down. You know, it's making me think of, you know, in this day right now when maybe we can't get a service appointment as quickly as possible or maybe people aren't doing in-person servicing you know and i don't know if there i'm sure there's different policies and things like that these people want to stay in business okay these people want your business i'm sure if you said 
can I do a Zoom call with you and show you how I'm threading this? Or can I do a Zoom call with you and show you what is happening? I'm pretty sure they would do a Zoom call, walk through, holding your hand type of thing. Now, yes, let's compensate them for that fairly, right? But let's give them our business and let's get the help from the experts. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So speaking of Bob and Case, that was right on cue, Eric. How did you do that? <laughs> um, because here oh we have my. a Bob and Case that's got some problems. Do I need to make it bigger? Yeah, you can't really, can't really see a lot of it on the top, but uh, when we get into the next picture, it shows it from the other side on the back side, I think, with all the holes all drilled through it. it was, it's, it's just a lighting thing with that picture, I think. I don't know see, if you had the second one. Yeah, here's the back. yeah on the bottom, on that bottom, like around the seven o'clock position, you can see uh -huh. the three holes. That's a needle hole that's been driven all the way through the bobbin case, and that is devastating. Wow, I don't even, I didn't even know that was possible. Yeah, well, it's got a powerful piece of machine. It will go through your finger. I guarantee. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah. What happened here, I'm I'm 98% sure that she didn't thread the take-up lever or it came out of that take-up lever. She had put a lot of thread down in the bobbin case, or he, I don't want to be chauvinistic, he or she put a lot of thread down in that bobbin case area, and the bobbin case became at one with the hook. The hook's the part that's turning around down there in, in the lower part and grabbing hold of the thread. So when those two melded together, it grabbed a hold of that bobbin case and turned it around right in the way of the needle coming down. And when that happens, something's gonna give. Uh, the left-hand side around the nine o'clock area, that's where your needle's supposed to be going in and out of. There's a very large opening there. If that bobbin case turns around, that's where the needle's gonna hit is where there's now plastic instead of that opening. Mm -hmm. And so especially if you use a brand new needle, it's gonna go right through that thing rather than, uh, rather than, um, you know, breaking on you right away. That's crazy. Exactly. So I just brought up this bad wiring picture. Oh. Now, what goes on here? I mean, is this something that just happens over time or did something yeah. interfere with it, this? It's time and heat. Um, it's an older Singer um, Blackhead sewing machine. And that motor can get really, really hot depending on. Uh, I had a person that she... I don't know what happened. Something fell onto her foot control and it just made it go a little bit. And a little bit of power in there stored a whole lot of heat in that motor and made the motor get hot and burn wires. This one, I have no idea. I mean, I was doing the cleaning on it, took the motor off and it's like stuck to the side of the machine. It was so bad. So a little combination of, you know, old insulation, old wiring. They made it out of different stuff a long time ago and the heat built up from the machine. But if you look at close to the motor on the right-hand side, those are bare wires. Those silver things are bare wires. So those two touching together are dangerous and a fire hazard. So in this particular case, she's got to get the motor replaced because it's one of those types of machines. You can't rewire it. Yeah, I was going to ask, how how was was this even repairable? Not on that one, only because you can't do anything to the motor. A lot of times you can, you know, motors are cheap. This one is not a cheap one. <laughs> this, is, this is a spe specific type of motor. Yeah. But yeah, it's better to just replace it than mess around or try to tape things up or, you know, separate wires and try to inside. They were touching all the way inside the motor, so it was dangerous from the get-go. Everything had to be replaced on that. Oh, yeah, that's frightening. So this last one I have here, I have never heard of this before. I had no idea this could even happen. So yeah. tell everybody what this is. Well, this is on a baby lock or a brother machine. And it's uh, when you've come down the front of the machine and come around and you're going up to thread the take up lever and back down. So you've come across the tension and gone down and up but where it's supposed to come up and slide off of that, really, I'm thinking it should be a metal plate put in there so it would slide off of that. But at some point, either heavy-handed, yeah, that zoom in on it, heavy-handed or holding it, you know, too tightly, the thread got caught on that 
edge, that slope that you see, and it started to cut into it. Well, as the machine, as the thread is seesawing back and forth, because it's going up and down, up and down with that thread, it is literally cutting into the sewing machine. So once it's there, she's catching it every time she threads her machine. It won't slide past it. It goes in that groove. So every time she sews, she's cutting that deeper groove, probably fraying the devil out of the thread because of the the friction and the the heat buildup and everything else it's got to be devastating on on sewing but that whole piece had to be replaced if we catch it early and there's just a little bit of a, a divot there we can take sandpaper and file that thing back to being a slope again and have it slide right off there no, no issues but once it got that deep we got to replace that whole piece there and i think it was part of our tension but it's it's that's an extreme issue though it's but it not, surprised not me uncommon. though that yeah, it surprised me that you said you've seen that a lot. Yeah, in, That's in crazy. a couple different places, we have plastic housings on the machines. So I always say to thread it with two hands, you know, from your spool to the first thread guide, and from there down to here. But you know, they're they're doing that to an extreme. They're really yanking and pulling or grabbing a hold of a cover before they do it, and it should just be a light touch when you when you thread it. Always thread with your presser foot up. That was another tip I want to throw out because you don't want your tension discs closed trying to put a thread in between them. If there's a spring-loaded tension on that, you're not going to get thread in between there unless you really pull hard with two hands. Opening your, Lifting your pressure foot opens the tension discs. Your thread falls in there, and then the, the discs close on top of it. It makes sense, but you wouldn't be, be surprised how many times I see people threading their machines with a pressure foot down. And mm -hmm. it can, if you start sewing like that, you have no top tension and all bottom tension and it bird nests up on the bottom. As soon as you lift the presser foot up, the thread falls Boom. in between there. <laughs> now they don't know the, how they made it, how they fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, I'm not touching anything now. Just yeah. keep Working. sewing, don't keep touch. sewing. Right. Yeah. Right. So what is your, I mean, maybe we saw a picture of this already, but what is the most you know, extreme crazy thing you've seen. And then we'll go to um, your favorite customer, which is the one that just comes in and says, here it is just coming for its tune up, right? The, mil the million mile tune up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I couldn't narrow it down to, oh my God, you would not believe what I saw today. Roaches. In a sewing machine? Roaches would be my most devastating earth shattering thing because they dropped it off when I had my store and it sat for about three days in my store. And then when I got it up on the bench, the roaches ran out at me and I'm like, ah! no, pest control for the whole, pest control for the whole store. No. I charged her, I don't know, $25 extra or something like that. But yeah, it's, if you have them, you have them everywhere. They're in your sewing machine. If they're in your kitchen, they're in your sewing machine. So, and they were little German roaches. I've had an issue in my life. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. <laughs> it happens. We live amongst the bugs, but <laughs> yeah, that was really bad because roach poop is smelly and it gets on everything. It sticks on everything. So that was the worst. Lately, this month, I've had one machine I had to condemn because of cat pee. Um, apparently the cat was a little jealous of how much time mom or dad was spending on the sewing machine and got up there and did a little shaky tail on the back of it. And it was all over crystallized on the outside of the machine, inside the machine, on her motor, on computer boards. Yeah. I'm speechless. So. I <laughs> had no idea you, you were going to say these things. No, I did not. I did not include pictures of either one. Some people might have some sensitive stomachs. But yes, cats do pee on machines. I've seen three of them that I can absolutely say it's cat pee because it crystallizes. It likes, it grows stalactites. <laughs> oh, my. So it's you right, knew what it was. They grow up. Oh, I know. Yeah. And I've seen it before, so I know what it is. And, I, and it's funny. Now I call up the customer. I go, I have a question. Do you have a cat? And she go, yeah. And I go, yeah, he sprayed your machine. She goes, that son of a... <laughs> oh. Yeah. oh, no. Okay, you've just prompted our next um, project that we're going to do. <laughs> on the So What, sure which is a machine. sewing machine cover. <laughs> you betcha. Because you could take that bugger off and throw it in the washing machine when you know he did it. Yeah. It's okay. the mail cat. 
I don't just, even you know, know what to say right now. I ha- I just, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> that I have seen it all. Apparently. Well, <laughs> nothing but the best experts for our So What crowd here, you know? Exactly. A little entertainment for you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my! I've I've like completely lost my train of thought. I just don't even know where to go from here. Um, but I appreciate I appreciate the stories. Um, but I'm sure you, I'm sure. <laughs> oh God, I'm sure you have um, some great stories too. Who, how you've made some people very happy to get their babies back who maybe thought it was a lost cause or didn't really know what was going on. So. I'm sure you have those heartwarming stories, too, where you get to make somebody's day. You know, that's probably, I, I, I almost would do it for no money because that is very rewarding. I feel like a superhero, um, like Tim the Tool Man, I feel like beating my chest, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm the hero and fix their sewing machine and send them back to do what they love doing. And, and yes, a lot of people, this is their baby. They do not want to let their baby go. And I, I assure them I'm going to treat your baby like it's my baby while it's in my possession, you know? So, yeah, I do get a lot of people that uh, are very sentimental about leaving their machines with me, for sure. Well, that's cute. All the more reason to take really, really good care of it and make sure that it is in perfect working order, especially as we embark on a brand new year of possibilities and great projects. So, Eric, thank you again for joining us today. Appreciate it. Come back anytime. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> and for all of you out there, if you have questions for Eric about your sewing machine, or if you have any questions for us regarding any sulky products or things that you are working on, or horror stories, and you need somebody to help you finish your last minute projects before they get wrapped and put under the tree, reach out to us at info at sulky.com. We are always here for you and we are super passionate about making sure that you have a great sewing experience. So thank you for joining me today. And like I said, I think a sewing machine cover is in our future. So all of you who wanna make that, give me a thumbs up, give me a little heart, um, whatever you wanna give me. And uh, we will see you next week on another edition of So What. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>